GP by background. My portfolio aspect is that I'm a medical educator. So uh, three days a week I do clinical stuff seeing patients and two days a week I'm a director of medical education for a GP provider company. Um, and I'm just going to let Chris and Christian in to introduce themselves and then we'll just um, start the session. Hello everyone, um, my name is Chris O'Deedon. I'm an ST4, almost ST5 in emergency medicine. So I work in the busy world of a &E. I'm a less than full-time trainee and I also host a music radio show and do some DJing here and there. I only got that as of the last four months, which is easier when you're less than full time. Sure. Um, just one thing to note to add to uh, what Maya said is that if you'd like to ask questions at any point during the talk, you can do via social media. So if you do, please include the hashtag more to medicine and we can pick those up as we go along. Cool, thank you. Hi, I'm Kishan Reese. I'm a clinical teaching fellow. I've got a portfolio career without the GP bit or the training bit. Uh, so basically I couldn't get surgical exams, tried them lots and lots of times. In all, October 2013 I went to become a teaching fellow with the idea that, oh that's great, that's an easy job, uh, I can get some time to get surgical exams. Uh, after doing that for a month and found out what it was like to have a life and see Watford play and see my family and go to the gym, uh, I decided that I'd concentrate full time on medical education, so I'm trying to make that into a speciality in its own right. It's not there yet. But there's still that awkward question when you go to an Indian event, somebody said, oh, what do you specialise in? <laughs> um, medical education kind of goes down like a bit of a lead balloon. Um, do, they, do, do they then say again, so what do you specialise in? Yeah, <laughs> pretty much, yeah. Um, so I think it's interesting that all, I mean, I got a master's degree in medical education, so all three of the panel went on to medical education and then did other things. Um, and then now I'm sort of infamous for some of the YouTube stuff and Facebook stuff that I put up um, in terms of the junior doctor contract dispute. Um, and I'm reading for an MBA at Nottingham. Fantastic. So uh, we're, all three of us are very keen that this is your session, this is your um, thoughts and ideas about diversifying. So although we like talking about ourselves, we definitely don't want to be doing that because this is all about you. So I just thought it would be really useful to kick off just to see who we've got in the room. So um, have we got any medical students? Um, any F Foundation trainees? Okay, and uh, specialist trainees? All right, GPs? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and any consultants? Oh, fantastic. Okay. Anyone who hasn't put their hand up yet? Who shouldn't be here? <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> okay, fine. So, and who already has an alternative career in mind? There is a roaming mic as well, if you'd like to kind of say your, audience, your question to the audience, that would be good. Okay, fine. So no, no one's kind of made their decisions yet so much. Um, okay, so I think what I want to do is just kind of open it up, basically. So if, you, if there are people in there who don't know what an alternative career is, what it looks like, um, then you know, feel free to ask questions, or we could talk about what a typical week for us looks like. Doing 
ad hoc teaching and I was lucky enough to have a really enlightened boss who let me do what I wanted within reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I then came, to, I came back to doing musical things after parking it at F2 because I thought, well, this isn't going to work. Uh, this doesn't fit with doing postgrad exams, this, that, whatever. And I, I kind of stumbled into it, essentially. I had time during this UP year. I emailed lots of radio stations about doing a radio show and somebody replied to one of loads of emails that I sent and the rest is a radio show. And when I got to doing it, I immediately thought, well, why didn't I do this years ago? Because I think I put up lots of barriers in my mind thinking this is technically challenging, it can't be done, and I feel like I imbibed some of the messages that it sounds like you're getting about your career, that these things can't be done. So what I would say about less than full time is I was lucky enough to then meet my TPD, who I only really knew from core training, I was in the same region, and say, well, look, I feel like I enjoy my emergency medicine job better now, and I feel like I'm better at it for doing it less. Mm. And hopefully, I presume there are people here who, can, who, have that, who have a similar experience to that. And she was really positive about me being less than full-time. And, and that was the, the key for me in that she facilitated the process. She acted as a mentor in that she facilitated it, found ways for it to happen. Unfortunately, the mechanics of um, less than full-time application, which is probably better if we talk about separately, are such that you have to have a reason to be less than full-time. Yeah. Most of the reasons are having children, being a carer for someone, or having a medical condition that needs extra care. But unfortunately, and, and so that's the majority of it. But there are other ways, um, but they do need a reason. I think I just want to say on that point, in terms of um, working part-time in A&E, to keep my clinical skills up, I've worked as a locum in A&E, and all the locums would bounce in there with lots of energy, they're rested, they're happy, they're healthy, and unfortunately in the NHS at the moment, you see people that are absolutely shells of their former self, sleepwalking in and out of hospitals, um, and it's very difficult, it's a really difficult environment, and it's almost like you said, you put some barriers up in your mind. I'm, I wonder whether when we go through medical school, we're actually... Uh, cut down into thinking you will only do medicine, you will only do this. And certainly every stage of my career where I've tried to deviate and do something different, I've had people knocking me. So when I left my ARCP, uh, CT2, they said, well, you know, if you're taking two years out, out of program, we'd want you to do a, a PhD. You know, you're only doing a master's. And I'm thinking, I'm interested in education. Lincoln want to pay for it. What on earth are this, is this kind of ARCP panel telling me? Um, so you've got to bear in mind that people will not necessarily embrace you to do alternative things, because, but just because it's against the norm does not mean it's not a good thing to do. Um, and I'm happy to keep in touch with all of you, as I'm sure we are, in terms of if you want any advice, one-to-one, you know, -one, just let us know. And I think it's, you know, I think Chris is selling himself short a little bit, because actually you do need to have the drive and the determination. Mm. It's very British to say, oh, it's quite lucky we had a really <laughs> good uh, consultant. <laughs> Let me do, but you know you've got to you've got to abandon those doors. You know these things to, to, to come out from the norm <laughs> takes persistence, drive, and determination. So um, you know if this is what you want to do, you've got to go for it. And you know and we're in a room full of people who have done it. We've gotten into medical school, got through medical school, um, and medical school has tried to kind of conform us and was pack it to me this stuff. morning was it yeah. me <laughs> yeah yeah that's right I'll tell you I was telling Kishore yeah. a pretty grim story <laughs> uh, did anyone watch that um, BBC programme was on meat and whether you should eat meat it was on the other night um, and I was just uh, they had a bit where obviously the guy goes down to the abattoir to see how meat is uh, produced and stuff uh, so you get all these cows in a room and they're all individual cows with their different spots and their stripes and all that kind of stuff <laughs> oh yeah this is like when you first go to medical school and then, and then they all have to shepherd in through this door, like one by one. And then on the other side, they're just strips of meat that all look exactly the same. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just... On that point, I was told once that SHOs are just interchangeable units that complete tasks at work. Fantastic. And at, at, what, yeah, but at what point, as doctors, in terms of the medical profession, at what point did we allow that to happen? Do you know what I mean? And, you know, get, I think, yes, you need managers. I'm doing an MBA. I'm not anti-management at all. But there are certain things that we've got to stand up for in terms of, yes, we can do different things, but we can still contribute to a medical profession in a positive way. We can influence it from the outside. I guess we're fortunate in that we're on the outside and we get so slightly more time. When you make that leap and you actually leave and you do other stuff is one thing. Um, but equally within the NHS, if you have different approaches to working and different ways with your patients, 
it, you can be really positive. Uh, one thing on that point is, have you guys heard of I Want Great Care? I always talk about that. Are you guys aware of I Want Great Care? Basically, rate a trader, trust a plumber for medicine. So medicine is changing, um, and we need to think about that. But that's a slight digression. There was a question. Yes, that's you. <laughs> Question for Chris. Very interesting. Um, I'm a trained uh, GP, ST3, and also senior songwriting musician. I, similar to you, and I took a sabbatical uh, to pursue music. And coming back into it, I um, had in a similar situation to you. Wanted to go part time to, to do both and have time to finish my training, but I was a sort of confronted with the barrier and told that. You know, that wouldn't be possible because you know, music doesn't go with medicine, and um, you know, I you know, the same said the same things as you, you know, it would make you a better doctor, and blah blah. So, I just wondered what deanery are you in, and how did you, <laughs> <laughs> how did you manage to convince them? Because, um, you know, there's something that I must have been doing wrong, you know. So, what was your name? Sorry, Kimia, Kimia, yeah, Kimia, and Louise, you asked the first question, didn't you? So um, I, I work in London, um, and one thing I didn't address just before was that the reality, as Maya is saying, is that drive does play a part in this. And I guess that's kind of inevitable. I do want to get away from the idea that um, you have to be you, you have to be ahead of the game because I'm very much of the mentality in A and E is that it's a team sport and uh, collaboration is the key. But we're all we're all special in our special ways. And, Trying to move away from being soppy and get to the point. <laughs> um, Good. I'm, I'm, lucky, I'm lucky in that, in some ways, emergency medicine, because we are so undersubscribed as a specialty, we're valuable. And so, certainly, the philosophy where I train is that we want to keep our trainees. Um, and that's not universal, it's not like everybody can do whatever they want. But um, I think, it, I guess, it was fairly obvious that I would be better doing the other things that I wanted to do in my training. And I had a lot of the training to go, so I suppose it fell to that person to think, well, I can let Chris do this and keep him as a trainee or run the risk of losing him. Now, not what every specialty will have that situation, and not every, re not every region will have that reason, and not every trainee program director or position or person in power will have that mentality. That's a reality. I would say specifically for you, Kimia, it may be that you can only influence that kind of decision making when you finished your training. That's possible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to provide advice, specific guidance, probably outside of the room for people's specific problems. That's not a problem at all. But I wouldn't say that necessarily you're going to definitely get a yes because there are always going to be closed doors. The idea is, is that hopefully as more of a group of people, if we're more open about saying yes to people and saying, yeah, you should do that as long as you fulfill your commitments and you are a uh, safe and excellent clinician, then why shouldn't you do these other things? If we're, if we're more open about that, hopefully it will happen for more people. So a quick point on that also is doctors, we're not very good at pitching things to people. So I feel more at home at business school than I do at medical school, and I was very much an outsider at medical school, um, struggling not to get kicked out, basically just trudging along in the middle to bottom of the year. And I think if you can make it so that hospital radio is going to, you can make it a patient education thing, you can do kind of, you can do different things on the radio, talking to the patients in hospitals and things about health related matters that are important to them. You've got to make it a proposition for your employer that you become an asset to them and they don't want to lose you. So you're not going there kind of begging, saying, please let me do this, let me do this. You're saying, look, I can do this for you and bring enthusiasm, bring, bring drive to it. And they might just say yes. Um, so I think it's a bit of both. Yes. Hi, um, uh, my name is Yes, yeah, My name is I'm a surgical registrar in Manchester. I just want to share my experience. Um, so I've uh, been around for a few years. I did core training and did a PhD. I uh, went back into training to do ST3. And then again, became solution a couple of times uh, following my PhD. And then in April this year, I decided to go less than four times. But really, it's not because I want to spend time. It's not necessarily because I want to spend more time with family. I was getting a certain amount of time. It wasn't that I wasn't getting enough time with family. I was getting my own time and my, you know, my, 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 my,
socialize, to start bringing it on, and I was feeling a bit burnt out. So I went out of the program uh, for family reasons, but really it was because I wanted to explore other areas and um, outside medicine. And also I wanted to be an alternative to leading surgery, because I thought if I continue working this many hours, committing myself to a surgical specialty for the next you know, five, six years, and then as a consultant I'll just burn out or I just want to join my life. And I found my experience so far in the last six months, I've actually enjoyed going to, going to work because I only have to work um, three days a week. Um, I'm doing 60% at the moment and I'll see how that goes. Um, and I've got other, day, other days to explore other areas in, in my life, but also things outside medicine. Um, and I guess maybe that's not, that's not what the LTFT is for, but that's what I, I'm making it what, what I want it to be. Because I, again, find the rules say that I can only take time out of the program for family meetings, but I'll, I'll decide what to do in, in that time, um, whether it's pursuing online business or whether it's um, you know, working with other uh, companies, not obviously full time or anything, but not, I'm not making any money at the moment, but I just feel that the, 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 the DMEs have this mindset where you have to be full time training and commit yourself or nothing at all. And they're probably willing to say to me, you know, uh, fine, you can leave training or, or be full time training or you stick to these rules. And I'm not sure why this rigidity is yeah. continuing. Absolutely, we're in this rigid system, aren't we? And it's kind of like the Truman Show. So, you know, you're in this bubble and, you know, everyone's doing exactly the same thing and everyone's in a certain stage of, of the bubble. But, you know, you just need to find that trap door that's, you know, that's not actually a sunset. You've just got to stick your head out and there's a whole world out there. Um, and then, and then you, when, you, when you reconnect with your enthusiasm and your passion, I don't know about you two, but basically I became a better doctor. Yeah, um, and that actually I remember that that was really important to me when I first started, um, and the system had kind of beat that beat out. Beat yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yes. Hi, I'm, my name is Monica. I'm a sexual health and CJD consultant. But I just had an idea while listening to you, and I think time and again it's about evidence and gathering that evidence. And I just thought it would be a really good idea to have a power part timers story collected in one place, which you could then use to perhaps influence stories like you've said, actually working less than full time makes me give more in the time I'm there and makes me a happier and better doctor. Mm. And, um, and there is one um, in the in industry sector, uh, which is run by a company called TimeWise. They do the Financial Times part, part time as people who you know, have made millions of round big companies in less than full time. And I think there's a lot of evidence out there that actually working flexibly makes you a better employee. And, um, you know, the Green Party has a shared leadership at the moment. So I think the world is open up to the idea, but I think being the NHS where you work in handcuffs a lot of the time uh, makes it difficult. So I'd be happy to put together on a career yeah. break and <laughs> get a bit of time. So if you wanted to sort of send me stories and if someone else wanted to help, Sounds great. maybe from the medical education, um, I think it would be good that these stories don't stay separate and get lost, but that they make something more powerful to influence yeah. others. Yeah. And, and even deaneries and, yeah. you know, um, sort of older and more rigid organizations. Yeah. I was going to say, if only we had someone who was involved with the media. I was going to say, I'm happy to help. Uh, we're live streaming it now because I think it's all very well doing this discussion to you guys in the room, but I think part of this has got to be open and part of this has got to be, we've got to be showing people, members of the public, that doctors are not greedy, mercenary, money grabbers. They are multi-talented people that could go off and do anything they want to and they choose to give themselves to the NHS. Um, and I think the political establishment need to wake up and unless they improve uh, conditions for people, they will leave the NHS and the NHS will collapse. Um, and that's why I'm live streaming this, that's why I want this to go out to a wide audience. I don't want it to get lost in this room um, because I want to kind of try and make a better health service. So absolutely, I'm happy to. Obviously, the, uh, the most interesting and dynamic doctors are all emergency physicians. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and so um, it's not an accident that uh, a third of our workforce are in Australia. Now, this is a, a true stat, a third of the UK workforce trained as emergency physicians in the UK currently works in Australia or New Zealand. Remarkable. So I, I, I totally agree with what Kishan says about changing things. Um, I, I did actually, uh, one, one really good, I've got no stake in Twitter, but one really good 
the method of sharing this kind of information exactly the long lines of what you're saying is Twitter. Twitter. I tweeted out the less than full time violence from London just for information purposes and just for a read if you need to fall asleep at night. I actually did a uh, ED job in Australia. Yeah. yeah, so that was one of the few that came back. Came back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a question. So I had a question for all the panel members. Um, so the question is, how exactly do you deal with the psychological barriers and the resistance that you get from external sources like your employer, friends, family that you would expect to meet if you decided to, let's say, go out for training or to go less than yeah. full-time training, but also from yourself as well, dealing with issues like invested this much time in me, I've invested this much time in myself, actually, you know, this is an appropriate path for me to take, how, how do you deal with those issues? I think, okay, so I'm half Indian, half English, so we always used to joke that my mum, when I got a B, would get very upset, and my dad would be like, well, it doesn't really matter, because the Indian mentality is you will be a doctor, and you will get straight A's, and you will go to medical school. So I'm fortunate in the sense that I haven't had to handle that pressure from a young age, but I appreciate lots of people are. I think some of the work that we can do in terms of recruiting the right people into medicine helps. Um, but I think you need to kind of be true to yourself. And if you're going to work doing something that you don't like doing, there's this mentality in medicine that it's all I can do and I've got to carry on and I must do it and that's all I'm trained for. But just remember what your 18 year old self was like when you went into medical school, however, you, however old you were when you went into medical school. And think all those skills that you've got can actually be applied to other things. And lots of consult management consultancies yesterday were saying that you get skills that are transferable, but they're not transferable. That it's not immediately apparent how they're transferable. So if you look at all the kind of media stuff that I do, people say it's media. It's not media. It's just communication skills. We're doctors. We're trained to communicate. All I'm using is using technology to communicate to a wider audience. That's it. Um, so I think be true to yourself and try to mitigate risk in terms of, I'm still a full-time NHS job doctor, and I do this in evenings, weekends, annual leave. If you're not sure, don't be pushed, don't make the step, do lots of research, think about it, talk to people, and then come to a decision that sits best for you. And don't, as doctors, we're very used to giving and doing stuff for other people. I don't think it's a bad thing to think about yourself a little bit, because at the end of the day, the rates of divorce, depression, drug abuse in doctors is high. Um, and we need to think about ourselves and look after our own health because we can't treat people if we're unwell. Um, just to add to that, um, I think self-reflection and constant reappraisal is mm. important. So, uh, and that's a journey, and it's a never-ending journey. That I, I don't think there's a, a goal or a necessary endpoint or finite position where I'm done. I don't, I, I don't believe that exists really. So, be prepared to think. Well, if something is not going right for you, use it as an opportunity to think. Well, could I do this better? or do I just need to try and do the same thing again? Maybe either or maybe hybrid of both. Also, I, I would want to get away from the idea that there is a utopian other career that exists yeah. without any of these problems because my partner works as a brand consultant. She hates her job and that's not because brand consultancy is a terrible career, it just doesn't work for her. And it's difficult for her to make the step outside just like it would be difficult for anybody or any of us in this room who doesn't like exactly what they're doing to work out because it takes time and it takes reflection. You can't always guarantee that you're going to come out with exactly what you want. But I think the skills that we are describing of reflection and appraisal and thinking outside the box and being open to other people's ideas are the right things to try and guide you in the right direction. Yeah, I think I think the interesting things are that you know we we're all automatically we're just trained to think well what's the next step. And actually what, what you need to do, which is what Chris is saying, is create some headspace. You need time to think. Yep. Um, and you're not going to get it right first time. If, if, if I were, if I thought five years ago I'd be doing what I'm doing right now, I'd be like, that's crazy. I'd never be doing that. I hate talking in front of people. Um, but actually when you start talking to different people and you start to connect and you engage, you're enthusiastic, and you're doing stuff that you love doing, you know, when was the, when was the last time you actually said that to yourself and I actually love what I'm doing? Um, you know, that's, that's when you start to make connections and you start opening doors and then you gain momentum. So don't think, oh actually I need to apply for this and then get an MBA and then do this. You don't have to, you can just start by starting on the weekends and 
just yeah. asking some questions and making some connections. You know, you could start here today. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm through. So, Chi, I'm one of the geriatric medicine um, registrars in KXS. Um, I'm, I'm just uh, wanting to come back to the LTFT um, idea that, um, that, that you brought up. I'm sorry, I don't catch your name about coming up with the evidence. Um, 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 yes, yes, sir. Um, and, and I've always found LTFT particularly interesting because um, a lot of the, in a lot of other jobs you can go taxi or you can go um, part time and you can do other things. Yet for some reason we can't, which is very, very strange. If it's also extremely important that we do, because how many of us here are burnt out by the constant systems that we've got to deal with? Um, and I wonder about um, ideas. I yeah. um, wonder if, if there's a rule in occupational medicine or within the deaneries that we are in where we can push out the FD a little bit more. I know currently the contract is due this one thing, which I'm not going to do that in particular. Um, <coughs> but there is something that we should maybe push. Can, can, um, do you mind if I challenge you, G? Yeah, Just because uh, you said we can't do it. Why can't we do it? Yeah. Sorry for the lesson. Yeah. But because by and large, based on the gold guidance, yes, the guidance, the, yeah. the gold guide, um, there is, I have looked at it, um, everybody says that it's got to be um, caring, caring responsibility, children or disability or medical condition. Or, that's, those are all category one reasons. There are category two reasons and I'm a category two trainee. I, I, I'm, I, I, I don't want you to think that I'm trying to blow what you're saying out yeah. at all. I'm just wanting to add to it that I would try and move away from Khan. In that, if we, if every person in this room immediately tried to be less than full time, I think that probably would be an issue because if an entire work workforce all of a sudden becomes less than full time, you have a workforce problem. But that I totally agree. Give me a great idea. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we said we talk about that. Um, um, but we should be encouraging these doors to be open. I totally agree with you. But let category two training does exist. I have a feeling this is purely an idea that people are discouraged to ask about category two training because they think the answer will be no. As long as you're prepared for the answer to be no and you've got a get out clause, then why not ask? What the worst thing that can happen is is that somebody will say no. Now, I'm, I'm not saying this is specifically for you, but I think we should be trying to summate information about people's experiences. I also think we should be encouraging people to ask, but also I think we should realize that although plenty of other careers allow you to be flexible, plenty of other careers make it very difficult when you, when you want to be flexible, try and make you do the same amount of work in the constrained mm. period of days that you have. So these, some of these problems we're talking about are societal, they're not just generic to medicine. That's another, another angle. I think also on that point, talk to your colleagues in other places as well, because one of my best mates, Hardy, left F1. After F1, he went to Australia and did F2 there. Leicester didn't want that to happen. He found people in London that let that happen. He spoke to Leicester and said, well, London are doing it. This is meant to be a national training scheme. Why are you not letting me? So just look a little bit wider afield and see what other people are doing elsewhere and then take that to, to your deaneries and put it to the... Be an, be an organised agitator. So don't be, afraid. <laughs> don't be afraid to be an agitator as long as you can do it reasonably eloquently, I suppose. I just want to say it's kind of interesting that you guys, your experiences are done. I just want to share some of my experiences because I've kind of taken a similar route to you. But actually, at the end of my F2, I just stopped. Um, I didn't apply for more training in the end. And uh, between now and then, I've somehow made it towards doing my FK next year without doing the FK. Wow. <laughs> And I'm just going to tell you that it is actually possible to get that way. I'll share with you how I did it. I finished my F2, it was really disillusioned with society, the state of medicine, society, a lot of other reasons. I worked on the board, need to go figure. Um, well done. Okay. But I had an idea for a website. I decided to go build a big social media platform in order to help finance that. I got interested in locally. I learned how these companies work. I basically was self employed, but I'd become the managing director of my own company. Which I that made plenty of good money in locally to some of the ESHO. The thing is, when you're working in that level as a local, you're still training yourself, you're still learning through your clinical experiences, you're still working with people who are training you, and still you see, you still accumulate all this stuff over time. A couple of years passed, 
got involved in all sorts of projects outside of medicine, had complete control of my own schedule. You know, shot music videos, got a hat shot music video at MPTV, I've worked at various companies, done lots of things. I'm actually involved in an app that's been shortlisted for an award today, uh, which will come later on, uh, by the way. Um, but the point is, you know, I got to travel around the UK, got to work around hospitals, got to know which hospitals were great to work at in ED and which weren't so great. I'm not going to name names. Um, and I got a good reputation just because I worked hard and I showed, you know, I was willing to work with others and learn from them, apply the standards of ACCS medicine to my own practice. And I got offered a seat of posting in uh, Derby and they had 27 places. And I brought a bunch of guys who were in long term middle grade posts without any real training or prospects as consultancies. I brought a bunch of them with me. And we're all going to do FCO now in the year. So I'm just saying to you, there is no one way to do it. There is just a way you just have to do it. You just have to do it. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Do we have T3 in GP training in Brighton, and um, I'm perfectly happy in my career, by the way. <laughs> Great. <Fantastic. laughs> um, but really, I'm trying to plan for after GP training because I, I kind of feel a little bit not ready for, for the future. And I know I don't want to just get a job at, at a practice, um, but at the same time, uh, I don't want to just be locally and be losing that, that structure quite interested in teaching, medical law, palliative care, lots of things. And how do you <coughs> stay organised when you're getting interested in lots of things and make sure you're keeping your clinical skills up? Because that's what I don't want to do, is to stretch myself too thin um, and, and kind of not be good clinically once, once I've kind of finished a formal system of training. So it's kind of for the panel and kind of for anyone else in the room that might have advice on so I'd say the first thing is <coughs> clinical is key. Clinical is absolutely key. And if you can get it so that you can kill more than one bird with the same stone, then it helps. So when I was working in A&E and I was locuming, the cases that I would see, and I'd get through a fair few, would form part of my teaching for the following week. Also because students are fairly demanding in the sense that if they feel that you don't know what you're talking about, because they're now consumers and they're paying nine grand a year for it, they will tell you that. And that's fine, and they should be, because, so that's one thing in terms of keeping clinical absolutely central to what you're doing and kind of have offshoots from that. So medical education was one thing, and then now it's management. Um, in terms of keeping organised, I'm horrific for that in the sense that I'll go off in one direction and say, this is a great idea, let's just do this and plough ahead with that. And Jack will, I asked Jack to write a negative reference for me, which one day I will release. Um, and it's, it's funny, it's useful in terms of, try and adopt a complete finisher mentality and I'm still learning how to do that and try and do things that are going to have maximum benefit and do that first um, I tell my medical students that when you're revising there's no point in going over the same stuff which is because it feels like you're working and I guess if I look at my own practice sometimes I can fool myself into thinking that I'm working but I'm doing something that's easy or enjoyable and I'm not really pushing myself because there's a bigger goal that's more demanding that I'm, a, I'm avoiding um, so yeah, keep clinical, really important, and try and adopt a complete finish mentality for the most important bit that you want to do at that, that time. Find a mentor as well, find somebody who does what you think you want to do and, and talk to them. We've only got a couple of minutes left, so we should we have one last question? I can just kind of remind you, you know, I mean, I've noticed the medicine training in Portugal, and I came from Dublin, so I'm a bit sleepy. I won't try yesterday. <laughs> now, I just wanted to add something. Um, I identify with Previously in non clinical roles, I've started a business back home in Nigeria. Before I relocated to Ireland in 2012, I just had just one thing to say. There's something about medical training that subconsciously makes us very dogmatic and risk averse. And when you're thinking of an alternative career, you need to put that away. You just need to, because you need to now look at yourself, really look into yourself. Are you looking for security or are you looking for fulfillment? Because my friend, I lost a friend in April. Long concept documents together. We had these great ideas. I conceptualized ideas. We thought we put forward a business plan to show the investors. And we talked and talked and talked and talked about it. But we never took it off the ground. And she died. And I had to write a eulogy. And it touched me because I was like, if this were me, would they say, oh, we talked about it? I don't want to ever face my 
last moment, knowing that I'm regretful about things I didn't attempt. And so that is what is prompting my own alternative career change. And I just want to tell you, just take the risk. It's your life, you need to write your scripts. You can't surround your, you sur surround your face to train your body. It's your life. You must remember that it's your life. So that, that ties in really well with the comment that came in. And I sort of Helen I said, this is so true. I trained as a dietitian and we were conditioned to work in the NHS. At the end of my training, I decided that I wanted to pursue a different route. The uni did everything to persuade me otherwise. Finish your training so that you still have options and then make it happen. There is no shame in it and do not let others make you feel otherwise. And that is the kind of environment that we're up against. Um, so I think that's true. It's just interesting, literally, as soon as you were saying that, that came through. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of truth in that. So last 30 seconds. Um, so the things that I've uh, kind of written down uh, to kind of sum up and just tr to try and kind of inspire you to move forward with this. Um, you have skills, they are transferable. Um, you've got to take a first step, so don't just think about it. Um, Self-reflection is the key. Um, you've got to know yourself to know what you want and what you like and pursue it. Um, don't say the word can't, because you can. Um, and ultimately it's not going to come to you, you've got to go to it, so you've got to work hard. So there's no easy way of doing this. You've you've got to put the hours in and sometimes it's above and beyond what your full-time job already is. <coughs> Any final thoughts guys? If you want to hear more about media and broadcasting come to the session in the afternoon. Oh yeah, I've got you doing that as well. Two o'clock in the uh, corner room. Okay. You'll be hearing from, from two amazing doctors who do media work and also work as doctors who are not me. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a little like half three in Oxford there's a little training thing that I'm putting on as well so if anyone wants to go on radio and TV and have their, put their views across, uh, I'll go through some stuff with you. But I'll go to you, come and talk to us. Cool. Thank you. Cheers. Wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm sure you'd like to join me in thanking the panel for a very interesting discussion. Thank you.